going into our next speaker, um, it's Jesse Contour and Taylor Bancroft. And Jesse Contour is an assistant professor of practice in UT Austin's School of Design and Creative Technologies, Arts and Entertainment Technologies program. Uh, Jesse holds a BFA in Digital Art from Northeastern University with a major in 3D Animation and a minor in Graphic Design. And Jesse graduated from Northeastern Magna Cum Laude with honors and was awarded Departmental Honors as well. Um, she holds an MFA in Design and Technology from Parsons School of Design where she graduated with department honors and Jesse began teaching in 2013 as an adjunct professor and adjunct assistant professor at universities and colleges in Boston and New York City um, maintaining a steady class load of 3 to 12 teaching hours in addition to teaching work Jesse worked in the game industry as a technical artist on three AAA titles and held a fellowship at the American Museum of Natural History where she designed and developed a permanent exhibit known as the Seismology Lab and directed the success of the summer program known as Blue Stamp Engineering through on-site remote and remote programming over four years. Um, this session, they're going to talk about uh, educational methods for establishing a baseline of computer literacy for students in creative fields regardless of prior technical knowledge. They'll go over strategies for students' engagement, scaffolding complex information in an approachable way, and building technical confidence in the classroom. Um, so we're going to cut to their presentation right now. You guys ready? Yeah. Okay. yeah. okay, you're live. All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. We're really happy to be here and uh, present this talk on creative computer literacy education. So, um, since you guys already heard a little bit about my background, I want to give Taylor a chance to uh, talk about her background as well. Taylor, why don't you take it? Ah, thanks, Jesse. Uh, my name is Taylor. I uh, am a part-time lecturer in the arts and entertainment technologies um, major at the University of Texas at Austin. I co-teach with Jesse. I have a bachelor's in psychology and also an associate in computer science. Um, I worked as a software engineer for a fintech startup and kind of transitioned to teaching. And I also currently work as a technical producer. Uh, for Stern Pinball's online achievement platform. Awesome. Yeah. So um, we'll be focusing um, our talk today on the curriculum and methodology behind the class that Taylor and I created. So this class is called Media and Technology Foundations. Uh, we designed and taught this class for the first time in fall 2021 and we tweaked it and are teaching it again this spring. So it's still a friendly, fresh class. Um, and before we get started, I want to give a note about our program and also apologize for the barking. <laughs> um, so AET is actually a Bachelor of Science degree and with the program focuses on industry standards. So we wanted to use this course as a way to start introducing students to industry standard technologies, tools, and methods that they will use in the program and going forward into their future careers. Um, and second, a quick note about our students in this class. So they're in their first year or two of the program, and this is one of their intro level foundations courses. Students come into our class with different levels of computing literacy, and instead of following uh, the throw them in the deep end method, we kick the semester off with several lessons on really foundational concepts that they need to grow into a career in technology. We actually um, consider this strategy a form of educational advocacy. We don't make any assumptions about knowledge that a student should have and instead provide a class-wide baseline upon which to grow. Um, by not making these assumptions, we try to make a space for all students to feel comfortable and it's to make them feel like this is a place for them to learn and not a space for them to try to play catch up. Um, so knowing those things, we cramped a lot of industry specific knowledge into this course on top of the literacy, design, code, and tech skills that we're teaching. 
So there's a lot of stuff that comes together in this course. All right, so we're going to start off by talking about how we created lecture material in these first three sections. We're then gonna transition to the projects that we built in this course, and then finally wrap up the talk with a note about the importance of displaying the information to students in a way that keeps them engaged. All right, so context. We want students to practice relating this new complex material, this technical material, to things that they're already comfortable with and interested in. So using this context is how we try to inspire intrinsic motivation for these students to gain technical literacy. So at the beginning of the semester, we have students do this really fun thing where they get to express their identity and interest by filling out a slide in our personal intro slide deck assignment. They each have like 30 seconds to present their slide to the class, and here are some examples of what each slide can look like. Um, through this assignment, we found that this is a really great way to start building a learning community for this class. We constantly refer back to these slides for name pronunciation and pronouns and reference material, um, and also recommendations for shows when we finish our favorite shows. Um, they've got really great taste in shows. <laughs> but it's a way for us to gather context. And um, this context that we gather, like knowing what kind of games and shows resonate with the students, it allows us to design lessons that then connect to things that they already know and care about. So for example, one of our very first lectures we give in the class is on how computers work, what are the parts of a computer, um, and we use the knowledge that the students love the Mario franchise to create a loose metaphor tying the functionality of computer components to aspects of Peach's castle in Super Mario 64. And, um, you know, looking at the slide, you can tell that we aren't necessarily trying to impart deep knowledge on this topic, but more so a general understanding because knowing about computers is something that's really foundational to understanding future hardware lessons, right? We work with Arduinos in this class. So, um, in addition to the things like the chassis, we also cover data cables, common peripherals, motherboards, CPU, GPU, memories, displays, all of these really kind of core components to a computer. And as part of this process, we ask students to help explain the metaphor. Like, if a port is like a window, what do you think it does? And this allows them to use their prior knowledge of Mario to figure out how computing hardware works. This is a really fun lecture, and not only can students apply new concepts to narratives that already exist, like Mario, but they can also come up with their own narratives too. So we try to help students internalize these technical concepts by tying lessons to creative themes and stories. So we really love reinforcing knowledge through storytelling in media and technology. It's definitely a theme. Um, dry material like names and jobs of PC components might be hard to remember by themselves, but stories are traditionally very easier to recall. So we're guiding students to be creative and forge their own connection to this new material. After we give this lesson, this Mario lesson on computing hardware, we challenge the students to embody this information through a storytelling exercise. So for this particular example, for this assignment, students are tasked with inventing a comic book character that represents a PC component and its jobs within com a computing system. So the format of this assignment is a discussion board. After creating and posting their character designs as seen here, they are required to comment on at least two other students' characters and discuss how their fictional heroes or villains would interact with each other. And these interactions should mirror how those PC components interact with each other in a computing system. I just love this assignment. The drawings <laughs> are often, they, they come back and we're just blown away by their creative talent. Remember this is um, arts and technology, so the students oftentimes come in with really strong artistic sensibilities and we like to build in some time for them to flex that um, in our class focusing on tech, um, and you know, they, they come in and, and the uh, when they start posting these, we have a Discord channel and the students are often just blowing up at how excited they are about each other's designs and the stories that they're telling with each other. It's like just a really great moment and we're all 
also reinforcing knowledge through the storytelling, so all together, so good. Um, and uh, so another example of storytelling in our lectures, so not long after we have the students do this character exercise, we introduce a more in-depth role-playing lesson. And uh, so this comes from uh, one of the first things that we noticed in our students' personal intro slides is that the students are very into Dungeons and Dragons and uh, role, other role-playing games just in general. And so, funny story, turns out, so are Taylor and I. We actually have been playing D&D together um, and other games for quite a while. And um, we wanted to bring that into our classroom because it seemed like it was a common thread. And um, we brought it into a lesson about file systems and navigating them via the command line. So this lesson ties together a few important things um, so one, how the file system should be organized, i.e. with organized folders and not just like all on your desktop or in the downloads folder. Um, and uh, two, how to move around, create files, edit files, etc. Um, this can scaffold future lessons in coding when they need to reference in outside files or do really anything that requires use of a file path. Um, and just remember, along with our theme of not assuming any knowledge, we have many students coming in who might have only had experience working with tablets or Chromebooks or, you know, hardware like that. So they might have never even seen a file system before this class. So building in this knowledge is really foundational. Um, and uh, so let's talk a little bit about what that lecture looked like. Um, the basic idea of the lesson is that we created a dungeon crawl using a folder system. You start out in your home folder, which has a spooky basement folder that contains files and clues. Um, leaving the home folder takes you to a map folder um, with other folders named North, East, South, South, and West. You can go into any of these folders and find jungle folders, desert folders, um, et cetera, with monster files, treasure chest files, or other files that you have to deal with in different ways. Um, for example, monsters you want to delete, you know, <laughs> treasures you want to transfer home into your basement for safe storage, etc. cetera. Um, we run this lesson by sharing the command line on the screen, and we have the students voting on actions depending on their role. So when we talk about roles, like what are their options for the roles? And the way that students engage in this exercise differs depending on the character trope that they choose to embody. So each character has a set of abilities that kind of play into their tropes and map to different commands in the terminal. For this example, wizards are known for creating nothing out of thin air. So naturally, they use the command in the terminal, make directory, making a folder from nothing. Barbarians are huge and strong, so the barbarian could use the delete content command and destroy a file representing a monster. Um, rogues in Dungeons and Dragons are kind of known for leaving no trace, so we gave them the ability to clear the terminal screen and cover all adventuring tracks if they're being tracked down. And then the final choice that the students have is if they want to be an investigator, they could list the contents of a directory to find any sort of hidden files that represent hidden clues. Um, we run this lesson, I think, on week two or three of the course, and this is the moment that I have noticed consistently that the students really come to life in class. Um, we have them, uh, at this point, this lecture is often run over Zoom because um, we have a hybrid class, and the students are all just the chat, the chat is like lit up in this lecture the whole time. They're like, go north, go north, delete, delete, like barbarians, let's go. Like it's really a very fun um, lecture. And I think by the end, they, they internalize those core commands really well. So it's a very fun day. And that that play continues on into the class because we set a baseline that's like, this is what this class is about. It's learning, but also fun. So it's a really great community building um, exercise as well. Um, so, we're going to move on from our lectures, um, which take up the kind of first chunk of the semester, and um, move on into uh, hands-on work and projects that we assign in the kind of 
two, later two thirds of the semester. And um, after a few intro lessons on hardware, this section of the course is really focused on building two major projects. So we're gonna talk through both of them. And um, the consistent goal of these projects when we design them is to be concept first. And we do that for a few reasons by putting the focus on the idea of the project, we encourage students to be creative instead of limiting themselves by focusing on technical complexity as a goal. This reinforces the, reinforcing the idea that tech is used as a tool allows for different methods of accomplishing a goal that matches our technical skill level, and it encourages creative problem solving to make something work within the guidelines of the project. And we've gotten really amazing feedback from students about using this approach as tech as a tool. Um, as an example, just the other day, we had a student come up to us and inform us that he had transferred from uh, computer science into our major, AET, after being kind of discouraged through some coding classes. Um, but he said that through these projects that we've had, where we use tech as a tool instead of that main deliverable, he felt comfortable and more confident in his ability to code, which is a huge goal of our class. Yeah, yeah, we work really hard to teach code, but also make it not scary. It's a, it's a delicate line to walk, but um, I think we're I think we're doing pretty well. Um, so, so let's talk about that first project. Um, this project is intended to get students into the design mindset and and a problem solving mindset, and also to apply the first couple lessons on basic code and Arduino into making an actual idea. So what we challenge them to do in this project is to uh, come up with a problem, something something that's like annoying in their life that they want to solve with the use of a little gadget. Um, and they have to then design a solution for that problem by um, producing two deliverables. So one of which is a functional breadboard with their chosen sensor and outputs. They have a choice of uh, five different sensors that they could use. And um, most students set up a pretty basic if-else block that defines some kind of output based on a certain sensor reading threshold, like fairly basic coding. Um, and then the second deliverable is a product design sketch that shows how their problem solving gadget would actually look in real life. So they're producing not only a design concept, but also a um, functional hardware code uh, deliverable. And the creative aspect of this project produces wildly different ideas using essentially identical hardware setups. And that's where I kind of think the magic of this comes in. Students really love this problem solving process. And uh, we're gonna share a couple examples of how different the projects can be with essentially identical hardware setups. So um, the top two are using moisture sensors, and based on a certain moisture sen sensor reading, they will output a light and sound, you know, some kind of alert. Um, one student designed something to detect how much you stink. Um, you know, if you're sweaty in your armpits, it's going to yell at you, being like, hey, you stink, go put on some deodorant. And then another student made a um, dog bowl alert where if your dog is thirsty because they're out of water, um, it will beep at you. So same hardware. Both of them are using a moisture sensor and alerting at a certain moisture level, but the concepts are totally different. Um, and then on the bottom, we have a flinch and a clinch, which is a favorite project of mine because the name is amazing. Um, but it tests how good you are at like making somebody flinch by punching as close to their face as you can without actually hitting them. So they're using a distance sensor to detect how close you can punch without touching. Um, and uh, the other one is the social distancinator, which uses the same distance sensor to detect if someone is getting too close to you and your, uh, your piezo will yell at that person to make them stay away. So um, again, same hardware setup, but vastly different ideas. I will say that like, a lot of these projects I wanted to purchase. So it was really cool seeing them come up with their design of what it would look like on the shelf. So this, this first project aims to get students familiar with using the hardware, but our second project is more about um, focusing on a larger final product with industry standard techniques and tools.
So we pack a lot into this final project. We had mentioned earlier how AET is a Bachelor's of Science, and so for this reason, we want to be getting students familiar early on with using these industry standard um, tools for the conception, planning, and execution of design-driven projects. So even if they're at this freshman level, we can still start introducing students to these tools and methods, and we do so in this final project after students are familiar with using the hardware, so it's not too overwhelming. So this top line here are like skills for building the actual project. We use an Arduino in this class, and we also use various fabrication materials. The second line here is uh, tools for collaborating with others. We use Trello and we use GitHub for debugging and version control. And then finally, this third line here is tools that we use um, to show students that you invite others into the project. So showing end product, um, and also integrating feedback for iteration as they're testing their project and pivoting depending on how a user interacts with it. Um, so, keeping in mind all of these objectives for the final project, uh, here it is. So, in this project, students um, are challenged to translate a folk or fairy tale into an interactive enclosure. And the catch is that it needs to have clear enough enclosure design that someone can use it and understand their story without any additional instruction. So the basic idea is that they're using cardboard to build this enclosure and they build movable pieces and things that get revealed as time goes on. So they need to build instruction in for where the user should move the piece, what, how they kind of interact and move through this experience. The um, hardware is really limited. They use copper tape to make switches, and they use servos to make things move. And they they also have the option of using LEDs or piezos, but not all students take that on. And we tell them at the very beginning that the grading focus of this project is on the design and storytelling aspects of the project. We really want them to push their storytelling skills and also their UI design skills. Um, we, we call this affordance design. How do you communicate to a user what they have to do with your enclosure through affordances? And, um, you know, taking a step back again, remembering that we make no assumptions about prior knowledge, this very well might be the first major group project that lots of our students have done. Um, group work is a big part of the AET major, and we have to, you know, get them started working in this manner. So we through the process of this project, we build in an accountability structure to project timeline. So this means lots of deadlines to help model a structure for how to manage time and how to break down a larger project into manageable chunks. This helps them as they move on to other classes that might not have this type of scaffolding. So um, we go through multiple steps. For like first step, focusing on concept and prototyping. Second step, kind of building that into code. Along the way, we play test multiple times, and then we focus on uh, designing that documentation and the way that they present it at the end. So there's a lot of steps in there, and they take that knowledge then into the future when they work on other big projects. Um, and I'll also add that as part of this process, we provide templates and step-by-step -step instructions. So we're really getting them hands-on, comfortable with how to do this type of work, um, and how to collaborate effectively on a team. And they also get really familiar with the expectations just for the you know, industry expectations for this type of production process. We found that using this also kind of refocuses the student's attention from final product to process and finding value in decision making along the way and pivot points and analyzing why they're running into issues. We have a couple examples that I was going to talk through. Yeah, so students had this uh, blast creating these interactive enclosures under these really tight constraints of the project. So with their only output options being a servo and then optional PAs or LEDs, students were having to think outside the box to create really interesting mechanisms. So we want to provide a few examples that the students made. Um, in the top left here, we have Billy Goat's Gruff. The goat appears to be moving across the bridge. The student to the right did a Goldilocks, so servo spin to reveal messages to a user and tell a story along the way. The third example here in the bottom left is Little Red Riding Hood, and 
and she, we use servos to kind of create a pulley system to display this linear movement across the enclosure. And then finally, one of the projects we really loved uh, was that students created this snow white kind of board game looking enclosure um, and used servos to create a pulley system that opens up the coffin and reveals snow white. And then we also have a video of one of our favorites that we watched. Yeah. <laughs> this was definitely one of our favorites. Uh, the students took a unique twist on the story of the three little pigs. Um, we were definitely cry laughing during the presentation, hopefully <laughs> you do too. Yeah. And I'm just making sure I'm sharing my sound. Wait, let me play this video.
questions or comments if you have them and, and thank you so much all right well thanks so uh professor akram here with cfgc and uh, i'm gonna uh, say the questions back to you guys as they as they come in but uh, do we have any questions from the audience um i know that let me pull them up here I'm trying to get our live chat up okay so um a couple of questions first off uh, i don't recall uh what was the name of your course again it's called media and technology foundation okay and so one of the questions uh, we have is, do you have any buy-in from, uh, how do you, how do you promote buy-in from students? I mean, are there any students who are like, oh, this is cheesy kind of stuff? That's a good question. That's a good question. <laughs> I think sometimes we do, we do have a little bit of that, but um, that's why we use the personal intro slides um, to connect back to stuff that the students Kind of say that they themselves are interested in and um, considering that lessons like our, our first few lessons on you know computing hardware file systems you know i think without the sort of fun that we build in those lessons can be really dry i remember when i first made that stuff and it took me several times through to kind of learn it because i too came in as an art student and i was like file systems in the con conflict what no i don't and and so by making it fun and saying like I'm a wizard, I'm gonna make the directory. They re those lessons really kind of get internalized through the storytelling we build into it. So even if a student feels maybe a little skeptical, oftentimes the uh, enthusiasm from the rest of the class to do a storytelling exercise because the students are all really creative. They enjoy this process of storytelling and fun, so um, I, I haven't noticed too much. Business. No, and I, and I will say that we, we lean into it really hard, and I think students are super receptive to that. Um, we are really enthusiastic in this class, um, and they like to make, <laughs> they like to poke fun at us, well, in a, in a respectful way, but we do it back and forth, and they mirror it in their presentations when they, um, when they present their final projects to us. Mm -hmm. All right. So I personally have a question kind of for you. You, you mentioned that um, most of your students come in from sort of an art background and then you have to teach them the technical stuff. I'm in the reverse side. So I get most technical stu students have more technical background and then we're trying to teach them design and art. So do you encounter that? And how do you combat that uh, when, when they don't? Or how do you combat both? If, if they're heavy on one side and not the other, how do you help them transition and bring the two together? Yeah, that's also a great question. So um, I we haven't experienced that too much in this specific class just due to the nature of the AC major, but I've experienced that <laughs> in the past. And one of the biggest things is whenever you design an assignment, you lead concept first. So um, sometimes I, I experienced that a little bit with, um, I'm one of the co-teachers of our senior design project. And by the time students get into the senior level, they often have very accomplished technical skills and they start focusing on projects that are tech driven. And we try to pull them back and make them do user research to uncover problems that need kind of project solutions and things like that to base their ideas in concepts and addressing a problem or a need of their audience as opposed to just using tech for tech's sake. Um, and that's also we, you know, the entire program is industry driven. In industry, you know, we are in a capitalistic world um, so like you need to be designing a product that someone wants to buy. And if you don't make something that speaks to what their needs are, um, then no one's going to buy it. Like a cool piece of technology that has no application is not very useful, even though it's cool. So we, you know, it might not be a fun storytelling exercise, you know, a fairy tale, but it is that same type of storytelling and addressing like a narrative that speaks to someone who might want to buy your product that same thing applies. So, um, you know, we emphasize that as part of the process. And I think that that helps to kind of pull it back a little bit from the tech focus. And we do have, we have such a wide array of students with very, um, kind of like various levels of technical ability and creative ability. 
And so it's, it's a challenge to design a course that, that meets all of the needs of, of challenging everybody where they're at. Um, but we found that like, you know, using an Arduino, wiring up your own circuits, like the project can be what you make of it. And so it is a challenge um, that's doable for someone who has limited to no technical experience, but then people who already have that experience can challenge themselves further by um, kind of creating more complicated code or, or telling a more complicated story. And so no one is bored. <laughs> All right, so a question from Pauline from uh, that. Um, you said this was a freshman course, and so the, with your answer, you mentioned uh, doing some stuff in the senior projects as well. How do you, uh, do all the courses in your program kind of still or carry over that idea of the design and the technical aspect? You know, it, it has to function, but it's got to be appealing as well. So how is that um, incorporated throughout the program, I guess, is the main question. Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say that in general, um, one of the big themes that ties together a lot of um, AET courses, there's there's like a couple different ways. So because we're you know industry focused, I'm gonna I'll keep repeating because that's just mm -hmm. huge in our program. Um, there are a lot of just core technical skills that you have to learn. So we have classes on 3D modeling, you know, materials and. Um, uh, textures and so there's a lot of like tech art classes um, there's also a lot of uh, huge like collaborative project based courses so uh, for example I teach a course on um, arcade cabinets so the students get to design a custom arcade game and then build also build and fabricate the cabinet that oh. it lives inside and so um, you know, the, the idea is like they know from the start that they're building an arcade cabinet, but they have to design the experience. So if it's not a kind of product or a story, there's an experience that's a core element of the design process. And um, or if it's one of those classes that are more technical skill driven, like our kind of 3D modeling class, they're building models for a reason. So a lot of the times they'll create kind of concept art that they then model and they imagine it as part of a larger piece. So um, there's there's ways that each course kind of ties the technical skills into creating something that has some sort of core concept um, as its impetus, so yeah. And from what I've seen too, there's also a theme in this idea of the process being something that you play test. Mm -hmm. um, so like focus on the process and focus on on making sure that you're getting feedback from others in those projects um, from concept to completion. Yeah, product and process. <laughs> Very nice, very nice. And for those uh, in the audience who may not be aware, do you want to say what the AT, the name of the program is? It's, what was it again? <laughs> yeah, um, so it's Arts and Entertainment Technologies. Okay. Um, this is our Bachelor of Science program, which is within the School of Design and Creative Tech at um, UT Austin. All right, all right. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Well, we want to thank you for your time today. We appreciate it. Um, your program sounds amazing. Uh, lots of fun stuff. We'd, we'd love to have you come out in person one day, um, hopefully. Uh, but thank you again for talking at CSGC 2022. And uh, any, any sign-offs, any last minute words or anything? Just thank you too. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I'll share my screen one more time if you guys have any any um, questions or want to get in touch, feel free to send Taylor and I an email or connect with us on social media. We're happy to have you to talk with you. But yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you today. All right, thank you.